Hey there, and welcome to Truth Be Told, a theology and apologetics podcast not claiming to have all of the answers, but created to analytically look at the truth contained in the Bible and encourage critical thinking on how to apply that truth to our lives. I'm Micah Gunn, and I appreciate you listening in. No matter your level of understanding or knowledge, I sincerely hope and pray that you find these words edifying, informative, and beneficial. So let's get started. So today we're going to be going over a really, really cool study. I'm very excited to go over this with you. It's actually something I've wanted to do for a long time and have had a few requests to do, but every time I go to write down notes for this and study it myself, going through different commentaries and uh, different versions of the Bible, things like that, I write down a bunch of notes and I think, yes, this is good. This is a good flow. Uh, This is how I should go through it. This is what makes the most sense. And then as I'm going through my notes, I think, ah, but what if I put this up here and I end up deleting the whole thing, starting from scratch. And that's happened like four or five times now. So instead, I'm just going to uh, go ahead and go through it. No notes. I have a few brief things written down so I don't forget them, uh, forget to go over them. But I also have like a billion tabs open. So no official notes. Hopefully we still have a good study and something interesting. And hopefully I don't forget too much. So Today, we are going to be going over the story uh, in Mark chapter 9 of the Transfiguration, and then immediately after that, we'll go through uh, when Jesus and his three disciples come down from the mountain, and he heals a boy that is demon-possessed. So it's kind of two different stories, but they definitely relate. Uh, They're chronologically one after the other, and that's agreed upon in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't have this account uh, written down, but we'll be going mainly through Uh, Mark chapter 9, and not the entire chapter, but a good portion of it, we will get into some supposed contradictions. We will uh, try and harmonize a few things and try and draw some lessons out of this part of scripture as well, and maybe ask ourselves some questions that hopefully we'll get some answers to. Um, But it seems to be whenever I study, I always ask myself questions going in, and then coming out of it, I might have some answers, but I also have about a thousand more questions which is great because it just leaves us more to study. Um, Not that the Bible is becoming more and more confusing the more that I study, but there's just more I want to know as I dig deeper and deeper. And that is a good thing. That that should be a sign of a good study, I think. So like I said, Mark chapter 9 is where we'll start. We're actually going to take this in two sections, kind of first starting off with the transfiguration, and then uh, we'll go through that verse by verse, and then we'll go into the healing of the demon-possessed boy. And we'll go through that verse by verse. But first, I just want to read through um, each section before we kind of get into the deeper study. So in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 1, if you're following along with me, I'm reading in the uh, ESV. It says, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them and there appeared to them elijah with moses and they were talking with jesus and peter said to jesus rabbi it is good that we are here let us make three tents one for you and one for moses and one for elijah for he did not know what to say for they were terrified And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Then in verse 9, And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So that is the account in Mark chapter 9 of the Transfiguration. And first, before we get into the study, we want to get a little bit of context about what's happening at this point in time. 
because everything that Jesus does is very intentional. He, he doesn't just say, well, what are we going to do today? He has a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing every step of the way. Not that human free will doesn't ever prompt some of his responses or reactions to things, but he also has um, a set. I think it's pretty clear how intentional he is in his actions and in his words all the time. So then where are we chronologically in Christ's ministry? I think the answer is in Mark chapter 8. It's also, uh, this is also preceded in Luke and Matthew. This is where Jesus is starting to talk to his disciples about what has to happen to him. And it's, it goes against everything that they know. Uh, the, the Jewish version of a Messiah at this time, what they were expecting was a conquering hero to come and lead the Jews against Rome and kind of be this, this warlike uh, figure for them someone they could rally around and they're excited to be on the ground floor of it but jesus is starting to explain to them that he has to die and experience a lot of suffering and shame and humiliation and he's doing this little by little getting them to kind of question their own um question their own understanding of what the messiah is but also uh dropping dropping hints about things that will make a lot more sense to them later and in so in uh chapter eight we have uh, Peter confessing Jesus as Christ when they go to Caesarea Philippi. And uh, it's interesting, I think, this section in uh, verse 27 of chapter 8. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and the others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. I think this is really interesting with the transfiguration because on this mountain, you have Elijah, and you have Moses, one of the prophets, and you have Jesus. And he's also explaining to them uh, the connection between Elijah and John the Baptist, as we can see in other, uh, I think it's Luke, where that's a little bit more clearly made. But then in verse 29, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So Pete, uh, Peter claims Jesus as the Christ. He knows that he is the Messiah. This is a, a big turning point because this is the point where everyone kind of knew it. I think the disciples kind of were aware of what they were a part of. But at the same time, this is uh, something's very different when something comes out spoken rather than just a rumor or something supposed. This is a certainty in their minds at this point in time. So this is Jesus Christ accepting the uh, authority and the title of the Messiah in the book of Mark, which oftentimes you'll find biblical scholars that say Mark is the one where uh, Christ's deity is the least certain. You find way more deity of Christ in John, which is thought to be a much later gospel. And they'll use this to say, well, in Mark, no one actually thought of him as uh, a deity. They, ne they never thought of him as the son of God. That only became a doctrine much later and that it shifted to become that towards when John was written. So if you ever come across that, here is absolute proof that Christ knew exactly who he was and he was okay with his disciples knowing exactly who he was. But I think it's cool in verse 31, it says, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And I read that part to get into uh, one of the biggest contradictions in this section, which is uh, actually in chapter 9 and verse 2, where it says, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. So in Mark, it says six days. In Matthew, I believe it says six days. Let me check real quick. Uh, yeah, in Matthew, it says after and after six days. And then in Luke, that's Matthew 17, by the way. And then in Luke, it says after some eight days. So this is a supposed contradiction that a lot of critics will look at. And they'll say, how does Matthew and Mark say six and Luke say eight. And the answer is actually really, really simple. 
Um, a lot of times we might be presented with this information from people that have high degrees or present themselves very well and confidently. And we think, oh man, I need this complicated answer from manuscripts, but you really, really don't. It's not that difficult at all. The answer lies in two simple words, and it's a question we should ask ourselves when we study. Um, hopefully, we're building these skills as we go through these studies together of asking ourselves questions, thinking critically about what the Bible says. But the two, two words, and the, and the question is, after what? So Mark and Matthew say, after six days, and Luke says, after eight days, after some eight days. Um, but after what? What's the beginning thing that you're counting down from? That's where this... Uh, starts to make a lot more sense. And it's really easy to see if you just look at the accounts in Mark and Matthew, what do they list that Luke does not prior to this account? And the answer is in Mark and Matthew, both of them mention Peter's rebuke of Jesus Christ. So to follow a timeline of things, you have um, Jesus beginning to speak to them about what he has to go through and who he is. Then as he's starting to preach, uh, that he must suffer and he must die. Peter gets very angry because his traditions are being put into question. This person that he loves is saying all this stuff against his beliefs and also speaking that he's going to have to be harmed himself, which Peter doesn't like. Then, So Peter bears with it for a little bit, but then gets angry, rebukes Christ, and then uh, Pete, uh, Jesus rebukes Peter back. And then you have a little bit more teaching, and after six days from this moment, you have them going up to the mountain and witnessing the transfiguration. In Luke, you just have the beginning of Jesus teaching these things to his disciples. You don't have the account of Peter rebuking Christ and then Christ rebuking Peter. And so you look at this and you say, well, what is Luke talking about? What is Matthew and Mark talking about? Matthew and Mark are clearly saying that Jesus taught for two days these things that must happen to him and who he was. And then Peter rebuked him and Christ rebuked him back. Then six days after that rebuke, the transfiguration happened. Luke doesn't list this rebuking from Peter and from Christ. And so he's just counting from the beginning of when Christ began to teach all of this stuff. And it even says that. In verse 28 of Luke chapter 9, now it came to pass about eight days after the sayings that he took Peter, James, or John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. So uh, it's pretty clear if you look at the account, sometimes I think we can almost over harmonize or we have to take everything word for word and we forget these accounts are written by different people at different times. And while they do harmonize, they might harmonize where one person leaves something out that another person fills in. And just don't get caught in the trap of when, you know, you're going to have people come to you if you get in any sort of discussion about the Bible with people that don't believe in the Bible. And half of skeptics will say the Bible is so different in its accounts, or especially the gospel is so different in its, its accounts. How can you possibly say that these are accurate interpretations or, or accurate writings? And then some will say, no, it's way too similar. They had to have colluded that this couldn't have been uh, something they wrote separately. So you're going to run into people on either side of it, either side of the argument, and you're going to have to probably field questions on either side. But don't get overwhelmed. There are answers. People have done extensive study on these things, and they do harmonize very well. It's just that not every gospel writer includes every single thing that they're talking about. If anything, the fact that Luke is saying after some eight days makes a lot more sense to me and actually speaks of biblical accuracy because he's talking about the beginning of when Jesus was starting to speak about these things. And he says, after some eight days. Well, where do you start from? The first time Jesus mentioned anything, the first time he said one word about it, do you say the first full day that he taught about it? So Luke gives a, a summation of an answer after some eight days. Whereas Mark and Matthew, who were actually disciples and who, or well, Mark wasn't a disciple, but um, it's believed that Peter instructed the writing of the book of Mark. And if that's true, then you have two disciples eyewitness accounts here that have a very uh, poignant moment in time that they're counting down from, which is why they can have more certainty six days after. 
So this is the answer. I mean, there are a lot of different people that will say a lot of different things, but the Bible can be harmonized, and the answers really aren't that difficult. So don't get flustered when you are presented with them immediately. Just know there are answers, and they're easy to find if you just take a deep breath and look across all the accounts in context. So now that we have a little bit of context as to when this is happening and um, what precedes all of this, uh, we'll jump into chapter 9 where Christ is talking to his disciples and he says to them, Truly I say to you, there, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And a lot of people will point to this as well and say, See, this is evidence that Christ was just a man or he wasn't who he said he was because the kingdom of God is not here. Other people will say, no, the kingdom of God must be here uh, within the generation that uh, was in the time of Christ. They must have ushered in that kingdom of God. I reject either of those views. And now that we have a little bit of context for what's going on in Mark chapter 9, as well as Luke 9 and Matthew 17, we can jump into the chapter itself. And it starts off with uh, Christ saying to his disciples that there are some standing there who will not taste death until they say the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, some will point to this and say, see, this means that within the time of the disciples, the kingdom of God would come. And so it must be here on earth already to some extent, or it's our responsibility to build up the kingdom right now. But uh, I don't see this as saying that at all. Other people will point to this and say, see, since the kingdom of God is not here, it means that Christ was a false prophet or just a man and uh, didn't have the predictive abilities that it, he thought he did. I reject this as well. I think both of these camps fall short of understanding what Christ was talking about. And I think they also fall short of what the gospel writers are putting very, very clearly in front of us. It's almost a case of, uh, diving too deep or not thinking at all about what the scripture is saying or the ordering of scripture. Um, but if you want some defense against some of these things, even even just very simply, uh, those that believe the kingdom of God is here or already or um, it is has been established at the time of the disciples, you just have to look through the New Testament and see all of the different scriptures that talk about the coming kingdom of God. Uh, one would be in Matthew 4, verse 17. This is the Lord's prayer, and Christ prays, thy kingdom come. It's not, uh, thy kingdom is here, or it's going to be here in a few days. He is telling them to pray onward into, uh, after he's gone, that God's kingdom will come. Also, you can just look at simple things like in Matthew 25, um, it talks about those who are on the right hand and on the left hand, uh, and on Matthew 25 verse 34, it says, then the King will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this speaking of inheriting, uh, you can't inherit something that you already have. So to me, it's very simple just to, uh, look at some of the verses in the New Testament and see the kingdom of God is not here right now, but it is something coming in the future. And to those that say that uh, Christ was predicting the kingdom, but that it's it's not here right now, and that's proof against Christ, I, again, I think you're missing the point of what Christ and the gospel writers are trying to tell us. Because immediately after this saying, it goes straight into the story of the transfiguration. And what do you have? You have some of the disciples. So, Christ in verse 1 says that some are standing there, some of the disciples standing there, won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So he's going to grant this to a few of them. And at the transfiguration, he takes Peter, James, and John, a few of them, up the mountain, and he's transfigured before them in all his glory. And he shows them this image of a, a peace or a taste of the coming kingdom of God. And imagine how cool it would be to be a disciple, especially Peter, who's kind of uh, almost like a heart attack sometimes. At the very beginning uh, of this account, he is rebuking Christ for basically what amounts to preaching heresy because he's going against everything Peter had ever been taught about the Messiah. And so you have this anger at Christ and this um, slow revelation that he's going to have to die and suffer and be humiliated. And then 
six days later, as after he's being taught all of these things, he also gets to see the glory of Christ and kind of the end result of what's to come. And those two extremes, I think would be pretty, pretty awesome for a disciple to see. Now, as we get into the transfiguration itself, uh, the accounts differ slightly, not in who is there or anything like that. It actually uh, continues fairly consistently all the way through until uh, what Peter says to Christ in Mark chapter nine, verse five, it says, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then verse six is where uh, I have a little problem with how it's rendered in Mark. It says, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. This to me makes it seem like Peter was so afraid that he just started to speak words and he wasn't even sure uh, what to say or what he should bring up. But as the spokesperson, he decided he had to say something. And so these words came out. I don't think that's really the case. Uh, that's not really how it's rendered in the original Greek. Rather than where it says, uh, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Uh, better, it, I think it's better phrased, for he didn't know what he was saying because they were afraid. So he wasn't thinking about all of the implications of what he had just said. He was distracted and he was terrified. He knew exactly what he said. He just wasn't thinking of it all the way through. Another important thing to mention is that while in Mark, it talks about Peter building tents for Elijah, Moses, and Jesus, uh, it's pretty clear that this has meant tabernacles and that he's hoping, most commentaries speak to this, that Peter is hoping that they're going to stay. And not just for a while, but maybe to set up this kingdom that he's heard about. So he's still not exactly getting it. And in Matthew Henry's commentary, especially, it brings out the fact that Peter had almost, because of this miraculous thing he was seeing, forgot about everything else going on down below. So there's only three disciples up here right now, and you have all the rest of the disciples down the mountain. And obviously, Peter doesn't know exactly what's going on down there, but we'll get to that in just a minute, how scribes and Pharisees are gathering together, and they're ridiculing Jesus for shortcomings of his disciples. But again, we'll get there in a minute. But it's just interesting that Peter kind of forgets what's going on in the world around him for the sake of this kingdom, where it's pretty clear that Christ, uh, while he is definitely here in this moment, and he's showing these three disciples something, he didn't forget uh, about what his overall mission was. He didn't forget about the people on the ground, so to speak. Again, it's also interesting, as before, how uh, Peter explains to Christ that a lot of people say that he is the Elijah to come or he is one of the prophets raised up. And here Christ chooses to speak with Elijah and Moses, the exact people that maybe the people thought that he was. And this next part here really speaks to the uh, importance of Christ over even these important figures in Jewish history. Uh, so we'll start in... Uh, verse 7, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. So this is another testament of the Father as to the divinity of Christ and the sonship of Christ in Mark chapter 9. For those that want to say that divinity of Christ is not in Mark or isn't really thought of in Mark, here's another part. Um, but also, this is an elevation in their minds above Elijah and above Moses for these disciples. So just to recap before we go kind of back down the mountain, so to speak, with the disciples in Christ in this narrative, we have the setting where uh, Jesus is explaining these things to his disciples, kind of making them question their predispositions on their beliefs about Messiah, explaining to him that he has to come once to die and be humiliated and then uh, die for the sins of mankind and then resurrected. And within all this time, he's showing them, uh, he's, he's teaching them all of it. But then here he shows kind of that full glory post resurrection of what Christ is, and also establishing his authority in his disciples minds to then share with everyone else after he's died and after he's resurrected. And then you have them going down the mountain together, and the disciples are still pretty confused. After over a week of teaching about this, and after the transfiguration itself, where they see this portion of the kingdom of God, they see Christ in all his glory, 
They're coming down the mountain in verse 9, and it says, He charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. So they're still not quite getting it. They see that he was just here glorified. He can be glorified again. Maybe they think he's uh, waiting to do this on a grander scale with everyone present, but he gave them a foretaste. Um, but they, they probably think it's still within their lifetimes. And then in verse 12, and he said to them, or I'm sorry, in verse 11, and they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And so this is them still not quite understanding things. And they're thinking, according to the prophet Malachi, where it says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. They're thinking, okay, so Elijah has to come before Christ or before the Messiah and that's kind of a marker of how we know the Christ is here. And so they think, okay, we just saw Elijah, but he's not here anymore. So we didn't hear about him coming different times. What's going on here? This is what they're, they're asking Christ right now. Why do they say that Elijah must come first? And then uh, Jesus replies to them, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. And if you read in Matthew's account, I think it gives even more clarity. In verse 12, it says, But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So here we have... Uh, this transfiguration kind of coming to a close where the disciples have just learned uh, in this one week period that not only is are they affirmed in their belief that Christ that Jesus is the Messiah he is the Christ but also that he is greater than Elijah and greater than Moses and that he can show them a piece of the kingdom and they also understand the fulfillment of John the Baptist coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, being that type of Elijah. This begs the question, at Jesus Christ's second coming, will there be another Elijah to make straight the way in the wilderness? I personally think there will be. I know others disagree, but it seems to make sense to me that that is something that's going to happen, particularly when Christ says, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. So you kind of have two different tenses of speech going on here, which I think speaks to probably a dual fulfillment of this prophecy in Malachi. So then as we kind of go down this mountain, so to speak, in the narrative with Peter, James, John, and Jesus, I want us to remember and keep in mind the two people that were on top of the mountain with them at the transfiguration, that being Moses and Elijah. Because I think we have three potential things happening here, or three potential reasons why these two people are up on the mountain or shown to the disciples at this time. Uh, one being that, well, actually, I guess you could say there's four. The one I mentioned before, where people have said that uh, Christ is the Elijah or that he is one of the prophets raised up, and now he's showing that he is not one of them. He is separate and distinct from them. So that's one. Another is, for the sake of just Peter alone, or maybe all of the disciples who have heard all of this kind of doom and gloom being preached by Christ about how the, all the humiliation he has to go through, the difficulty he has to go through, and now he's kind of showing them, especially Peter, who seemingly can't really handle all of this information, he's showing him that there is a future glory to come, and that partly their view of the Messiah as this coming king, this, this conqueror full of glory, that is partially true, that is coming, even if it's not at that first coming right then when they were around. So in part, it's a blessing to the disciples and uh, something that they will preach to the world after the resurrection uh, to say that he is one greater than Moses and Elijah. I also think we have two other things going on that kind of tie into the next story as we come down the mountain. One being the separation between Christ, Moses, and Elijah, the elevation that he has over these two and uh, how different they are when the cloud covers them and the voice says this is my son in whom i'm well pleased or my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased this is an elevation of christ over these two very important figures in jewish history but then also there are a few in my opinion what i, what I see is typology there are a few points of typology 
in this next story between Christ, Moses, and Elijah. So hopefully we can capture those as we continue on with the story as Jesus and his disciples come down the mountain. So hopefully we can pick up on some of these things as we continue reading in Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. And also I think it's really cool that even though these things happen chronologically, you have before the mountain, you have on top of the mountain, and then you have after the mountain. They kind of seem separate, but the gospel writers, even though yes, they are chronological, so it makes sense they'd put them in this order, uh, they chose to include these things and they are related in a way. So we need to be reading them in light of each other. We can't read on top of the mountain uh, the, or the story of the transfiguration without understanding what happened just before it to lead to that moment. And we can't read after the transfiguration without thinking of the implications of what has just happened. Sometimes I think we're tempted to read these stories individually, especially with uh, chapter breakings and section headers and things like that. But these are all very much connected. So hopefully we can see that as we continue on. So once again, we'll start reading in verse 14 of Mark 9. It says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. Verse 22, And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Other translations or other uh, accounts say, If you can believe, all things are possible for one who believes. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Other translations will add prayer and fasting. So here's the account. It's a lot of scripture. Let's get right into it. So a few things to notice right off the bat here, you have Jesus coming down off the mountain with three of his disciples to meet up with the other disciples, and they're presented with this crowd of people, including just the general populace, scribes, as well as the disciples, and they're all arguing, and it seems like it's this kind of sea of chaos going on. And I'm immediately struck by the similarities between this and the account in Exodus of Moses coming down off the mountain with the commandments from God. And the people have reverted back to their old ways. They are worshiping a golden calf, kind of living in debauchery. I think this is further emphasized by what Christ responds to these people that are arguing. Uh, while some people say this is directed strictly to the disciples, I think it's pretty clear that he's talking, and most commentaries will agree, he's talking generally to the scribes that are arguing with the disciples or the crowd that's arguing with the disciples rather than the disciples themselves, although you could say it also extends to the disciples. But in verse 19, he says, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? This to me speaks a lot of what Moses was probably thinking to the people as he is very frustrated as he comes down off that mountain and sees them uh, after he's left them for such a short time, basically falling back into their old ways. And if that's not enough connection for you, which I could totally see uh, as you're reading this, you could look at it and say, yeah, I could see that there's similarities, but I'm not sure that those similarities were intentional. Maybe they're just coincidental. But this is where it gets really cool. If you look at Exodus 24 verses 12 to 18 and read the account of Moses going up the mountain, what he does, or what I'd rather say what Christ does really mirrors this account. He takes 
uh, his disciples, his three prominent disciples, Peter, James, and John, who are going to play a huge role in the facilitation of the early church. He takes them up with him to this mountain. Moses takes his assistant Joshua up on the mountain, at least part of the way, to receive the commandments from God. And in verse 14, he said to the leaders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are here with you. Take all your disagreements to them. So here we have very, very close similarity to Christ leaving some of the disciples behind. And the scribes in this account can easily be related to the leaders of the land uh, at the time of Moses. So really the exact same thing is happening as they are going up the mountain and then coming back down the mountain. Christ is almost reenacting all of this just in his time with his people. And I think that shows a real connection going on here, especially when he says, take all your disagreements to them and look at what the scribes are doing, taking their disagreements to the disciples. So that's really, really cool. And then also another thing that a lot of commentaries will list is something that we might just read over uh, on first glance, and that's in verse 15. It says, And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. Now, why are they greatly amazed? Some will say maybe it's just the timing of when he shows up as these arguments are happening. He shows up right at the perfect time to kind of defend himself. After all, they weren't sure when he'd be back. I would think this would be more of maybe a relief to the disciples. Um, I can't really understand why it would be something amazing to the general people or to the scribes themselves, but it says they were greatly amazed and they ran up to him and also mentions it's immediately when they see him. A lot of people will point to this and say, it's very possible that when Christ came back off the mountain, similarly to Moses, how his face shone when he saw the glory of God, Christ, after being transfigured into his full glory, uh, might have had some residual effect. And you can't prove that. I can't say that that absolutely happened, but it's just something interesting with all of the parallels we've seen. And then it would answer the question, why are they amazed? Uh, why immediately when they see him, especially if he's not right there, um, they're seeing him from maybe a far off, why are they immediately amazed and run right up to him? I think that answers that question, even though it is speculation, but a lot of commentaries will list it. So here we have our first uh, comparison between Christ and Moses. Later, I think we'll see comparison between Christ and Elijah. But again, all of this is in context of him being elevated above these two and above all other people in all the history of Israel. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that's a very prominent message here. But also in the context of him teaching his disciples about the glory that is to come, but about what has to happen first. And I think he kind of does this in reverse order. First, you have the transfiguration where they get to witness the glory of Christ, the glory of God. And then here in this section, I think a case can be made, and this is really, really cool, that Christ is using this event that's happening as a teachable moment for his disciples. So he just showed them the glory of God that is to come, and now he's showing them what has to happen first, the humbling of Christ, the death of Christ. And I think we'll see this as we go along. To me, this is one of the coolest stories in the whole gospel, um, and it might be something that we just read over as a general healing, but again, Christ does everything very intentionally, and we have to read things in context, thinking critically about what we're reading. So I'm excited to do that about this part because I think it is one of the most human moments where we can see the human condition uh, laid out before us and we relate to it and we understand it. And I think when you add the story of the crucifixion and what the crucifixion means, what Jesus Christ's death means for us, and also what he's trying to say to us through this situation about the crucifixion, about his death, um, I think if we put these two things together and we see how related they actually are, it's not just a general miraculous healing. This actually has a message to his disciples and to us as well. Um, I think we get a real, real fullness of scripture if we study it in this way, looking for the connections uh, that the disciples might have seen writing this uh, well after the crucifixion happened, but then looking back and seeing the connections that Christ was trying to bring to them at the time. So he's kind of teaching them ahead of time things that they would know uh, after all these things had already been fulfilled. And just as a bit of a qualifier, if you're listening to this and you say to yourself, yeah, Micah, I can see kind of what you're saying, and I see that there's definitely parallels and similarities somewhere in there, but you're not really sure if this gives us the authority to say this is exactly the intent of the gospel writers, that is totally okay. I am only presenting this as my own study and parallels that I see as being too weighty to overlook. But if you don't see them or they're not helpful or beneficial to you, feel free to reject them and or maybe just say, yeah, that's interesting, but I don't know. That's pretty much what I'm saying here as well. 
Um, it's interesting to me. It brings a fullness to reading scripture when I see parallels and connections. It inspires me to see the interconnected nature of scripture. But if this or anything that I'm saying, maybe just one piece of what I'm saying, doesn't really fit well with you, that does not mean you have to take it. Um, I try and say over and over again, I'm not an expert. I'm just someone doing study and then presenting my information. So just want to say that as a qualifier real quick. That being said, I do think we will find connection and some of it is so weighty that it is hard to overlook, um, particularly for me, but I think for you as well, we'll see some connections. So hopefully, like I said, you find it edifying, enjoyable, beneficial, all those good things, and we have a really good rest of our study. One thing to keep in mind here as we're reading this is that this is only weeks after Christ gave the disciples authority over unclean spirits. He sent them out in his name to heal people and to cast out demons. And they were excited about this. They have this newfound ability through Christ. And um, I'm sure they're using it wherever they can to help out people. And when he leaves and comes back, he finds that they were unable to cast out this unclean spirit from this boy. And this is what prompts the argumentation from the scribes and the crowd and the disciples. This is what prompts all of this chaos because the scribes think they finally see a hole in everything that Christ has said. This is exactly the moment they've been waiting for where something that is um, unexpected is happening. Something that pretty much all along the line, Christ has been in control of the situation. Everything that Christ has said he can do or will do, he does. He's been amazing people and gathering a following. But these scribes have just been looking for a chink in the armor and they think they have it. So this leads to a lot of argumentation where probably the disciples are defending Christ. And maybe some of the people are defending Christ. Maybe some of the people are taking up the side of the scribes. But this is the chaos that we come down on. And this uh, prompts Christ to say, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So um, this father is distressed. He brings his son to Christ. And not only does he, has he had this spirit for a long time, but it is causing him a lot of harm. It's not just uh, mental difficulty but it's actually harming him and seeking to kill him. And this is something the father's been dealing with for the boy's entire life. It doesn't say how old the boy is, but long enough that this father is absolutely desperate, probably doesn't have a waking moment. Um, this is something that he's got to keep on top of 24 seven, probably so that his son doesn't die. And obviously he has a lot of love for his son. And here we have a moment where the scribes believe that Christ has failed um, because his disciples have failed. And we're going to come across a time here where probably everybody thinks that Christ has failed. And this goes into our connection that we'll see about the crucifixion. So they bring the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. So this is the response of the spirit. It is not a typical response that we see in other accounts where the spirit pleads with Christ or the spirit uh, sees the authority coming towards him and recognizes his time is short. This is a spirit that is not going down without a fight. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So this has been happening for a long time. It seeks to destroy the child. And uh, the father says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And here Jesus turns it around on the father and says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible for one who believes. Now we've talked extensively in past episodes about the correlation between faith and miracles. And uh, that's in past episodes. But just to reiterate, Christ is not dependent upon our faith to work miracles. God is not dependent on us believing in him to uh, work amazing things. We're not talking about a Tinkerbell situation here. We are talking about the all-powerful God of the universe who created everything well before mankind existed. Um, so he does not need us. He's not reliant upon us for our faith in order to work. However, how he chooses to work is by not forcing himself uh, on us. He does not have to work in the lives of people who don't want him to work in their lives. So he does ask faith of us because he chooses to work in the lives of those who have faith and want him to work. So that's all that is. Uh, you can check out past episodes if you want to find out more about that, but I'm um, not going to go into it too extensively right now. Just wanted to cover that very quickly. But here in this account, we can even see further our reliance on him because this man does have an amount of faith 
but he recognizes that he is not full in faith. And I think we all go through times like that. We look at someone like Peter, who is right with Christ, and we think he had to have more faith than us, and yet Christ calls him, O ye of little faith. So what hope is there for us? We are not right there with Christ, physically seeing him work. All we have is the text of scripture. And we also have doubt, just as human beings, we have things that we run across that pose some difficulty in our minds. But this man recognizes his shortcomings and he asks Christ to even help in his unbelief. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Asking Christ for the very thing that he needs, uh, the very thing that Christ asks him to have. He says, I have it in part, but I need it in full. And we see that Christ grants it um, because he does heal the boy. But before that happens, like I said, we see Christ uh, it seems like he's struggling. I don't believe for a second that he is struggling. I don't believe that this demon or this unclean spirit poses any actual threat or any difficulty for Christ to cast out. But again, I think he's using this as an object lesson. So let's see what happens because this is very unique. We never see Christ um, kind of struggling to cast out a demon. Typically, the demon comes to him imploring him uh, for something, whether it's to be thrown into swine or imploring him saying our time has not yet come but here it is uh, this demon throws the boy down at the sight of jesus not going down without a fight and um, when jesus saw that the crowd came running together after this man asks for help with his unbelief it says he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it you mute and deaf spirit i command you come out of him and never enter him again and so this is this is really interesting because oftentimes we see christ casting out spirits but very rarely do we see him saying, and also never enter him again. That's typically up to the person. It says that um, if you don't strengthen your mind, if you don't fill your mind with Christ, then even more could come back if you allow your mind to continue to be weak. Um, but he says, and never enter him again. But here we have this spirit still not listening. It says, and after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. So it took a minute. It was not going down without a fight. And imagine the scribes here who already think that they have Christ cornered, where the disciples have failed, and now they see this time where um, it looks like the Spirit is prevailing. It looks like, even probably to the Spirit, um, it's winning because this is not a typical casting out of a demon. And how cool is it to see the parallels where at the crucifixion of Christ, it seems like evil has won. To everybody around watching, it seems like Christ is struggling. The humanity of Christ is very apparent. And it seems probably to all evil spirits and to all people around, including the disciples, that evil has overcome uh, the power of Christ. And imagine being Peter, James, or John, having just seen the glory of God and now seeing this spirit not listening to him and uh, not going down without a fight. And then at the very end, it does come out, but it says, and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead. So this ends in the death of uh, a person and it seems like evil has overcome. But what does Christ do? Instead, he, uh, not, he doesn't give up. He doesn't say, okay, now it's over. I've lost. He knows and he's in full control the entire time. In verse 27, it says, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So this to me speaks so clearly of what is to come of Jesus Christ where evil seems like it prevails, but at that exact moment where evil seems like it prevails, Christ is in control the entire time, God is in control the entire time, and life overcomes death. In this moment we see it, and I think uh, at the crucifixion we see it as well. So here we have two parallel stories, one at the transfiguration showing the glory of God to his disciples, and then also one here showing what has to happen to Christ in uh, just a little while. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to be laughed at and mocked as these scribes are doing to him. They're looking for a way to discredit him and they think they have it here. But at this moment where it seems like Christ is the weakest, he is actually the most in control and he ultimately rises victorious at the very end. So to me, I see a, a teachable moment here for the disciples, a correlation between the crucifixion where all seems lost, but it really isn't, and it ends with life overcoming. And then you also have the glory of God uh, shown on the mountain. And I think the disciples would have looked at these accounts uh, as they're looking back and say, wow, um, look what he was trying to show us as he's trying to teach us about all that the Messiah had to do and all that he will do in the future. 
And here also we have the parallel that I promised between Elijah and Christ, where in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah raises the widow's son. Um, It's interesting that she says to Elijah in verse 18, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. So she blames Elijah with the death of her son. And imagine what these people would have been thinking who are already against Christ. Imagine what they would have thought when they see the end result of him trying to cast out this unclean spirit is a dead child. They would have blamed Christ for that death, just like this woman did to Elijah. But what does it say in verse 19 of 1 Kings 17? And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. Then he cries out to the Lord, uh, praying, Uh, that he be healed. And then in verse 21, it says, then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. So here we have this thing happening three times where Elijah stretches himself over the child. Um, It didn't happen the first time. Just like when Christ tells the demon to leave, it does not happen the first time. There's fight left in this unclean spirit. And here uh, it takes persistence for this child to come back to life in Elijah's account. And then it says, the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And in verse 24, And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Imagine also what happened to the crowd, what incredible bolstering of faith they must have experienced as Christ raises this child, not only defeating the unclean spirit and overcoming when it seemed like he was struggling, even though he absolutely was not, but also then raising this child up after they thought hope was lost and it was dead. Imagine what they must have seen. I think similar words might have come to their mind. Now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. It is constantly amazing to me how much we've been given in scripture. This is just one chapter in Mark, not even the full chapter, just two stories. And if you look at things like context, um, you look at the accounts across both Mark, Matthew, and Luke, you can draw out so much from these scriptures if you just think critically about what you're reading. So here we have the transfiguration showing the glory of God that is to come. Here we have uh, what it seems like a struggling Christ to people who are already against him, only to have him glorified in the end or vindicated in the end. Um, with the healing of this boy, the casting out of the unclean spirit, and then the the raising him up from apparent death or what it seemed like death to all the people around. And you have this lesson of, um, yes, humiliation that has to come for Christ at the crucifixion, but also this overall redemption of mankind, this overall restoring to life of mankind, this overall victory for Christ at the crucifixion. And this is all in two accounts where he's trying to teach his disciples about what's going to happen, trying to dispel what they already think has uh, the Messiah has to do and explaining to them that he has to do more than just what they think in uh being this conquering hero leading them against Rome. He's there for a different purpose and he's trying to explain all of this. It's just incredible. And then this story ends with him uh, in Matthew teaching them again about his death, for uh, foretelling his death and resurrection one more time because clearly they haven't gotten it, but he wants to repeat it enough times that after he is dead, after he's resurrected, they can look back on all these times and say, wow, look at how many times and in how many different ways uh, he showed us what was coming. And here, just at the end of the account, it says, And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Quickly, just to comment, a lot of people will say, maybe this means that this is a more powerful type of spirit, or maybe because it had a hold on this boy for so long, it was so powerful, and so they couldn't. Um, I I don't really want to get into speculation on, on any of that, but... Essentially, it's. I think it's really important to look at this section and see how the disciples would have felt because they're curious. They've been given this authority and they're asking, why couldn't we do it? And immediately following this account, you have the story of the disciples arguing on the road about who is the greatest. So imagine this, three disciples taken up to the mountain with Christ to see the glory of Christ. They are probably feeling on cloud nine, even though they're not supposed to tell the other disciples what they saw. That's supposed to be reserved for after the resurrection of God. Um, So even though they're not supposed to share that with them, 
they probably feel pretty great about themselves. They've been given this authority to cast out demons. They are given this special view into the kingdom of God. And then they come back down and their fellow disciples have failed to cast out a demon. And they're talking amongst themselves about, hmm, I wonder who is the greatest. The three probably think it's those three. Um, the others are probably defending themselves. And to me, that's just really, really interesting that it happens right after this. It shows definitely the attitudes of mankind if we're not careful. Uh, where we can think ourselves better than other people. And essentially, Christ's response to this is to show them all that they have a lot to learn. He was teaching both sets of disciples, the three that he took up on the, on the mountain and the, the others that he left behind, he was teaching both of them different aspects of what they needed to learn the entire time. So he puts a child in the midst of them, take him in his arms, and he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So he's kind of rebuffing them, explaining that they have to be as servants, and that it doesn't matter which one went up on the mountain, which one was down below, the intent is for them all to learn something, and that they have so much more to learn if they're arguing about uh, who is the greatest amongst all of them. That was not the intent of what Christ is trying to show at all. So here we have these two incredible stories. I thank you so much for listening and doing this study with me. I know it's a little bit longer than what I typically do, but there's just so much in here. And I think both are related so closely that I couldn't really do it in two parts, but I'm hoping you followed along with me and enjoyed um, digging deeper into this teachable moment that Christ shares with his disciples, this uh, few week long process of explaining to them uh, what exactly the Messiah has to do getting rid of their predispositions about what they thought Messiah should do, and then also sharing with them not only the crucifixion and the humiliation that he had to go through soon with his death at the cross, but also his glorification after that and everything that that entails. So hopefully it's a teachable moment for us as well as we can read through these two accounts and gain so much more from scripture just by thinking critically and uh, reading the Bible verse by verse, line upon line, precept on precept. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you doing this study with me. Hopefully it's been a benefit to you. And until next time, keep on reading your Bibles, keep on thinking critically about them, and continue to be humbled by what we learn. Because like this man who recognized that he had belief, but he cried out, Lord, help my unbelief, we might understand something, but we can cry out, Lord, help me to understand better. And we might know something, but we can always cry out, Lord, help me to know more. And we might learn something, but we need to realize that there's always more to learn. We need to ask God to be with us in those studies to help guide us in our learning our knowledge and our understanding and stay humble in the fact that whatever fullness we have or whatever fullness we need in these things it all ultimately comes from god thank you guys so much for listening have a great rest of your day